This episode is sponsored by Fire and Fuel Coaching, where I help you discover who you are and where you want to go, both on and off the job. For more information, please reach out to me at my Instagram handle at Jerry Fire and Fuel. Welcome to today's episode of Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund. And if you haven't already done so, please take out your phone and hit that subscribe button. I don't want you to miss an upcoming episode. And hey, while your phone's out, please give us a rating and review on whichever platform you listen to this podcast on, such as iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. It helps this podcast grow. And the reason why, when this gets positive ratings and reviews, those platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify show this to other people that never listened to this podcast before. And that allows our podcast to grow and make a more of an impact in other people's lives. So if you would do that, I would appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. My very special guest today is Lynette Fritshaw. And Lynette and I are going to have a conversation about what she endured being on a job in the fire service as a female. Some of those personal attacks that she had to go through, the gender discrimination, and a whole lot of other things that she had to endure while being on the job that I just don't think people should need to go through. Um, We are supposed to be a brotherhood, and sometimes that doesn't happen, and it turns into these just personal attacks and destroying of one another but Lynette has turned this around and she has got an incredible story she has embraced the journey that she went through and turned out that she discovered a lot of things about herself and learned how to grow from it and she is taking that and helping others to reframe what they're going through and grow from those experiences now let's jump right into this podcast with my very special guest Lynette how you doing, Lynette? I'm great. How are you? Good. I'm doing so good. Thank you for coming on the podcast today and uh, sh- you know, be willing to share your story because right, not all stories are easy to share. It's an absolute honor to be here. I'm so thankful that you asked me to be a guest. Uh, yes, um, of course. I haven't told much of my story so far, so this is this is a big deal for me. Yeah, I can totally understand that. Um, it does probably bring up some emotions and stuff like that. Can you tell the audience just a little bit about yourself? I live in northern British Columbia, Canada. I've been in the fire service for 18 years. I was a full-time career firefighter structural for 14 years, just about 14 years. I just retired in August. Yay! Yay. Took an early retirement. <laughs> 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 Took an early retirement. I have a 10-year-old son who is super active and keeps me on my toes. I have an amazing husband. Um, I'm a dog mom as well and a stepmom. I have all the titles. And yeah, I'm venturing out now into a whole different career. I've started my own business and just kind of going to see where that takes me. Yeah. So, I mean, taking an early retirement or retiring at, at all is very difficult. Um, How difficult was that for you? It honestly, it was time. It it had been coming for quite some time. I knew I needed to do it for my own well-being. I had to put a stop to it. Um, So it actually wasn't difficult once I actually took the action step to make it happen. Then it was just like a massive weight had been lifted off. We always hold ourselves back and it's like, I know what I need to do, but I just had to do it. And it's been honestly amazing since. I have no regrets. I don't miss it. I miss certain things about it. I miss obviously my community, working for my community, but now I'm able to do that in a different way. I miss some of my coworkers and otherwise it's just, it's the right thing. Yeah. Before we get too far down into your the kind of the details of your story, but you talked about like, I, you know, you needed to do it, but you took like probably a lot longer than you wanted to, to like take action. What was, what was holding you back? Honestly, stability. <laughs> it's just that, you know, yeah. mental game of, you know, steady paycheck and steady schedule. And I had been an entrepreneur for years prior And it was a huge transition to go into, you know, a pay schedule and holiday schedule and losing that freedom. But they kind of sell you on the pension plan and all of these, 
you know, benefits and all the stuff. And so you get into it and then like, okay, now I have to let all of that stability go. And I have to fend for myself, basically. Yeah, that is really difficult. I call those, and I'm not to like downplay, you know, your situation. Um, I recently retired as well. And I, I call those real world problems, like making the transition from, you know, the being a first responder into an entrepreneur back into an entrepreneur is really difficult because there's, I, you just have different problems, right? You haven't had those same problems for years and now you got new ones, especially one that's really like a uh, steady paycheck is really good and benefits. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Cause my husband is also a contractor. So, you know, benefits and, and stuff is, was kind of on me and now it's, but you know what, there's other options and you just have to kind of actually lay out the facts and I'm like, no, we have options. We can, we can do this. Yeah. I, I love the positive mindset that you have. I mean, cause it, it handcuffs a lot of people, right? You probably know mm -hmm. people like I do that want to retire and probably should retire but the one thing that holds them back is paying for benefits and that pension like i know yeah. quite a few that are literally they know the exact day that they're going to retire and they are just waiting it out they they should go now because their heart isn't in it anymore but they've got that deadline <laughs> and they're just going to go and grind until they hit it and to me that just wasn't I had a deadline too. I always said I would leave by a certain point, but I was like that. I can't, <laughs> I just can't <laughs> grind it out any longer. There's no point in being there when your heart isn't in it, when the passion isn't there and you're not doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. Cause it doesn't, I mean, don't you feel like maybe it takes a heavier toll if you're just grinding it out and not necessarily having all the passion that you once had when you got in? Absolutely. I don't want to be in a position where I have to be somewhere. I want to do, I get to be somewhere. I want to be somewhere. Yeah. I, I admire your, your words. Like there's so much power in words and I, I can see that you've done some pretty good work on like, you know, the power of words. So that's awesome to, to see that. But Lynette, let's like dive down a little bit more into your story and kind of like, how did you get to where you're at today? Uh, my story is a little different than a lot of people's when it comes to the first responder world. I think it's very common. It just doesn't get actually talked about much. Being a female, we are few and far between. So I believe that it's even more common. Although I have had quite a few men come forward since I've started sharing my story saying, I can totally relate. It's It's happened to me. My trauma doesn't stem from going to the calls. Yes, I've seen horrific things and I, you know, was impacted. I'm not heartless. They did, you know, impact me, but I had coping skills in place. But my trauma comes from bullying, harassment, discrimination, men in authority positions. Yeah, I mean, it does. I think it does probably happen higher at a higher rate to women. Um, just unfortunately, right? Still some of the bias i guess you want to call it still still there and it you know it and it does happen to to men too so i think you know if you're listening to this and like ah uh, you know this is just happens to women it doesn't it i mean look around your department if you look and you're willing to do the deep work and look it's happening to someone else in the department you know potentially um well, and sometimes it's hit as hazing or initiation or you know they can hide it in all different ways but Sometimes it's taken to the extreme and we're in that position and we fought hard to be in that position. Like you don't just get a job as a firefighter. You, you have to fight your way in and go through thousands of applications sometimes to get that position. And so to just give it up because somebody's being mean to you, it's the whole suck it up buttercup, right? And you just take it and take it and take it or you won't have a career. Right. And, and I'm I'm sure, right, that sucking it up and taking it happened a long time to get you to the point where you're at, where you're like, I've, 
I've got to be done. I can't do this for my, my mental health anymore. Absolutely. It started right. Well, from before I even got hired, um, it started then, and then it went throughout in spurts throughout my entire career. And then right up until last year, there was, um, an incident and I was like, that's it. I'm, I'm done now. I started taking the steps to make sure that I was set up and everything was ready. I'd been doing my business in the shadows for the last couple of years. And it was like, okay, now it's time to get serious because this is, it's happening and I needed to make it happen. Yeah. How did, like, how did you handle just the repetitive, well, just, can we just call them attacks on you? Sure. Sure. Um, I suppressed everything for many years, like for a decade of enduring and I sacrificed and I suppressed and it took a toll on my family. It took a toll on my body. You know, I was told in the very beginning that I wasn't allowed to cry. One of the captains asked me what I would do if I seen a dead body. And so I honestly have no idea because I've never seen one. Yeah. And he said, well, I'll tell you what you're not going to do. You're not going to cry. And so I didn't, I suppressed and I used anger instead. And I, you know, I, anger is socially acceptable. So I could, you know, punch a hole in a wall or I could, you know, throw a fit and throw stuff or be angry. And that was acceptable. And I didn't cry and I suppressed everything. And my body started to fight back because suppressed emotions wreak havoc on your body, <laughs> which I didn't know at the time. And you know, it also sacrificed my family because I became such a control freak because I couldn't control the threat that was happening at work. So I wanted to try to control any threat that could possibly come into my home life. And so I was angry all the time and controlling everything all the time. And when you're in it, you don't see it. And it took a lot of work and finally acknowledging that I was actually living in a trauma response every day, all day, and started doing some work and understanding what was going on. And then that's when I started to actually see the toxicity that was around me as well. And it's a harsh reality. Yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, I, I can get right, like, you're talking about, like, I've never seen a dead body, I don't really know what my reactions going to going to be. I mean, that's, it's very fair. And most first responders right they can keep it together like on the scene right we're kind of like strangely built that way and the but then to continue to suppress that emotion and have to do it like you know back at the station or whatever like that then i think right this starts the 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 buildup of just continuing to suppress so much right con con constantly and and i love how you talk about anger is socially acceptable but other emotions are not you know socially acceptable why do you think anger is like socially acceptable? I, I honestly don't know in the fact of maybe it just makes you look bigger and tougher. It, you know, crying makes you look weak. It's kind of, you know, it was an old boys club when I started. So that was kind of the the mentality of, you know, you're a girl and you shouldn't be here. And if you cry, because girls cry, that's just going to ruin everything. And yeah. there was nothing in place. There was no critical incident stress management. There was no diffusings. There was no talking. There was nothing. It was, you're fine, right? That was the extent of any conversation. It's like, yeah, good. And then you, you know, continue on to the next call and the next call. And then you go home and it's, you know, the end of the day and somebody does something a little bit wrong or they left something in the wrong place and everything just comes out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. Um, <laughs> I, I would generalize. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that can, you know, relate to that because you're right, right? Even though work is kind of chaotic, right? And the and you don't have, really have a lot of control of what's happening at work, but there's some more comfort of control. I feel like, at, you know, when you're on duty and stuff like that, and when you get home, you're like, yeah, this is not how the house is supposed to be being ran. And then you write your first thing is go to anger instead of like understanding maybe. I think for me is work wasn't a safe space. So I just did what I had to do and I used the skills and tools that I knew and was trained for. 
And when I got home, it's like a kid with their mom, right? That's your safe space. And you just can be yourself and lose it. And I feel like that's how it was for me was I would come home and they got the brunt of everything that I had endured from the day, even though it had nothing to do with them. Yeah. Yeah. That That's unfortunate, you know, and that, right. That's stealing a good career that you had all those moments. I feel like steal away from it. And then you're trying to like, did I have a good career? Did I do good things? I was I impactful. Was I, you know, did I do the community right? And then when these type of like attacks come at you and things like that kind of just takes the luster of your career away. Is that, I mean, would, is that how you feel or? Absolutely. I feel like there's so many situations because of the things that happened within my department that I wasn't able to actually live to my full potential in my career because I was always trying to prove myself. I was always having worry in the back of my mind. Um, I'll tell you a little story to begin with that set the tone was my very first day on the job. The senior captain took me aside who didn't want me there and made it very clear that he hadn't wanted me there. And he took us into a a room, closed the window, closed the door in the dispatch area. And he sat me down and he said, there's something that you need to know. We've all had conversations and we're all in agreement that if you get yourself in any kind of trouble, we're not coming to save you. You're on your own. And I was like, okay. And I, I didn't really know to the extent of, you know, the conversations that had happened. I thought I had a few friends in there, but I wasn't sure on who, and I didn't know the brotherhood is it's tight. So I didn't know who would, you know, be willing to or not. And so in the back of my mind, every call that I went to, I was like, don't fuck up because I don't want to find out if he's telling the truth or not. Right. So there were so many times when I held myself back because I didn't want to take risks in the, in the potential that I could get myself into trouble. And I didn't want to find out if anybody was actually going to come and save me or not. I would hope, but you just don't know. And when that threat is told to you very very straight face from somebody that's in a very senior authoritative position and you're the rookie you take it seriously yeah yeah I I don't I don't know how you could not and so that kind of set the tone for you know quite a bit of the well the whole beginning of my career and then don't get me wrong I worked with some incredible people I worked with men of true integrity integrity and honor and you know stand by the brotherhood and sisterhood and are amazing, amazing men. But there's still those little bad seeds that, you know, you can't, you can't get away from. Yeah. I I mean, there are definitely the bad, bad seeds, but they just, they seem to like to latch on to, to certain people and just on a more frequent basis. Like it's just, not there are a bad seed to a bunch of people, and there are those too, but there are some really that just, for some reason, they just don't like you, and they're never going to like you. And which is fine, was- right? I don't expect everybody like like me, or probably right? you don't expect everybody like you, but there should still be a professional. For sure. And they would tell me, you know, what? I like you. You're a nice girl, but I don't want you here. You don't belong here. I'm like, okay, cool. (laughs) But I'm here and I have the type of personality that when you tell me that I can't do something or you tell me that it's not possible, I will prove you wrong and I will show you otherwise. And so that kind of worked as a fault to me because I wasn't going to allow them to win. And I will show you and I will prove to you that I belong here and I will prove to you that I can do the job. But it just never seemed to end. It was like that constant having to prove and it's exhausting. Yeah. It's very exhausting to to feel that pressure and constantly looking over your, your shoulder. Um, for those who have never like been in that situation, well, I'm super happy for you. But if you ever find yourself in that situation, um, you'll know how exhausting it is. Like it, it and it's relentless. 
exhaustion. Even even off duty, it's exhausting. It is, and then you have you know an image to uphold when you're off duty as well. So it's like you you're wearing this facade, and I lost every piece of my identity. Like I felt like I didn't even know who I was anymore because I was trying to be everything that they wanted me to be. I was trying to fit in in places that I wasn't being accepted. And then I also became a mom at the same time. So I lost, you know, pieces of my identity that way. And I was yeah. like, I, I don't even know who I am anymore. I just know that I'm really, really tired. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure things probably even uh, probably changed, maybe even got worse after becoming a mom. Um, just in the whole control piece, it did. Right. I, I was trying to control every threat that was ever possible for my family, which is not possible. Control is an illusion. But in my mind, I couldn't control this, but I could control this. And so that, you know, added to the stress of it. And then being a mom and I am the only female in the department as well, like the first ever and only. So I'm the only woman that ever, you know, took maternity leave in the department. Yeah. So that was a big, you know, what do we do now? Because <laughs> right. this has never happened before. And so trying to juggle schedules, my husband also works shift work. So we had two sets of shift work. He was a seven on seven off. I'm a four on four off. And so twice a month, our shifts would cross over. Well, you can't get daycare for night shifts and try to get daycare for two days a week. It's you know, almost impossible. So my family, my mom was a saving grace and stepped in and sacrificed her time to be able to come and spend the night at our house when we're both on nights. I pack a pager. So I'm always on call. So in the off chance that I was going to get called, I always had to have somebody here because if I get called out in the middle of the night, my husband's on night shift. Whereas it's a different dynamic unless somebody is also married to a nurse or you know, someone that works shift work, you don't understand how that takes a toll and what you're expected to do. I, my pager would go off in the middle of a birthday party. Yeah, Duty calls, I have to go. And people don't understand the extent to which that takes its toll on you as well. Right. You know, it, it takes a village. Like I had to have every base covered in order to be able to work my shifts. Yeah, that would be exhausting in itself on a on a daily basis to to be in that situation, trying to constantly figure out if my pager goes off, what's going to happen? Like who who has the kid, right? Who's who's doing what? Yeah, whereas most, I mean, and not to label, but most men when they you know their spouse is at home and they can just go. So it's it was a different it was a different scheduling dilemma. That's for sure. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about, you know, this taking a toll on your, on your body. Um, just all this stress, right? It's just stress and probably a whole bunch of other words I could, things I could throw in there, but stress being, you know, one that all of us can really understand. Like I, I've, I explain people diseases, dis-ease, right? It's mm -hmm. the dis-ease in your life is going to find a place in your body to just anchor and wreak havoc yeah when you suppress emotions because emotions are meant to come out and be expelled and so when you suppress emotions they attach themselves to your tissues and your organs and they will cause you dis-ease at some point and people will go to the doctor and unexplained back pain and unexplained illness and unexplained whatever's going on in your body and tests come back normal but if they would only say, you know, what kind of trauma have you suppressed? What kind of emotions have you suppressed? <laughs> what, you know, what kind of stress are you under? And so I had, you know, lower back pain that was just relentless and that knot in between the shoulder blades and eye twitch that would last for months at a time. And I mean, I'm super active. I'm very healthy. I'm very fit. But I was like, what is going on? And then when you actually start releasing that suppressed trauma and suppressed emotions, I'm like, hmm, there goes the eye twitch. Mm -hmm. No need to go to the chiropractor three times a week now. My chiropractor even noticed because I was the exact same every single time I would go in. And he's like, okay, what are you doing? Because 
like you're good. Yeah. I was like, huh? Well, I actually just did some work and released a whole (laughs) ton of emotions (laughs) and some suppressed trauma. Voila. Yeah. (laughs) How let's, let's kind of go down that road a little bit. Like, so through our careers, we suppress a lot of different things, right? Probably both on and off the job, we suppress them. And then we talked about, you know, how that like gets in our body and anchors in into a place and causes havoc. So my thought lately is there's not a lot of like emotional intelligence that kind of talks people, you know, teaches them about emotions and how to feel them and what to feel. And, you know, and they, they can be different for different people at different times. But how how did you discover a process or come up with your process of like releasing those emotions? Uh, well, the gym has always been like fitness classes in the gym has always been like my physical release. Always. I, I always say that's my therapy. But I, but I leave, go into the gym and I leave it there. But even at times that wasn't enough. And so I was doing, you know, massage and Reiki breath work. But the biggest release for me was when I started doing hypnotherapy. Um, I found an amazing hypnotherapist and went in and started dealing with some suppressed trauma and like the physical release at the same time was mind blowing. And that's where I, I had the biggest life changing alter, I think for, for getting rid of that for sure. I think there's, there's some different ways to, to release trauma. Do you, you probably, did you go through a couple of different things like, okay, maybe this is not as productive as I want to be. And how'd you discover like hypnotherapy? Was there other things you did first? Oh, I did so many things. Um, so many things like, (laughs) you know, yoga and meditation. Um, like I said, Reiki massage, trying to get rid of, you know, all of the stuff that way, breath work, quite a few things with breath work. I did retreats. I did coaching. Um, I did all kinds of stuff and I just kind of got to a standstill and I had watched a girl on Instagram for over a year and I was like so skeptical. And I thought, no, that's, I thought finally one day she said something on her stories and I was like, I'm doing it. I'm going to try it. And I'm going to allow myself this, I think was the key to be completely open and brutally honest with myself because I had kept secrets to keep others comfortable for so many years that I didn't know how to actually say them out loud because I was worried, you know, the repercussions. And I was like, this is going to be a safe space to be able to just let her buck. And I have to, and we'll see what happens. And that was a game changer. I think you, you, you touch on something like allow yourself, right. To, to do that. When you haven't allowed yourself to do that for so many years, this probably was not like an easy process or just like a one day, you know, thing, right? Yeah, it it actually got to the point where I you have to be able to say enough is enough. I feel like in our healing journey, in order to be able to actually have breakthroughs, you have to have had enough of your own shit. You have to say enough is enough. I'm not doing this anymore. And I will just trust the process and see where it takes me. And it was such a release. It was so freeing to be able to actually say some things out loud other than, you know, to my mom, who basically knows everything from start to finish. Nobody else knew. They knew bits and pieces, but I'd never been able to actually say so many things out loud. And I think that just that in itself, that true honesty with myself. Yeah. I mean, you like, it's a journey, right? This is a, this is a process. This is not like, right. Journeys have twists and turns and ups and downs and, you know, doing right. Work on yourself is, de- is definitely a journey that you got to stick through. Right. Cause you, you know, like there's just, it's not always up, right? You have to have those ups and downs. And, and I always say like, I like to do a lot of personal work because I like to have those ups and downs not be so drastic, especially the downs, right? Not just be this massive down, 
that takes me forever to get out of this hole. Oh, absolutely. It is. I always say it's a roller coaster ride. Like you better buckle up because it's a roller coaster ride. And you, you know, and it's, it's dark and you don't have any idea of where it's going to go. Like it just, and then sometimes you'll circle back to the same stuff because you haven't quite finished what you need to there. And yeah, trying to get out of such deep, deep lows and not allow yourself to get in and stay there and actually feel it when it's there, acknowledge it for what it is, and then bring yourself back out. Feel it when you're there, right? So when you suppress so many emotions throughout your career, trying to like really feel something, I feel like it's a little bit foreign. It's absolutely foreign. And your mind will tell you, I don't even think this is the right thing. We shouldn't be doing this. This isn't this isn't the right feeling. It doesn't go with this because we're used to being angry all the time. So to feel softness and sadness and, you know, compassion or empathy is like, <gasps> what is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I know we talked about, you know, anger being kind of like our go-to feeling um, often because, and just, we talked a little bit before we got on about some We'll call it a little bit of more trauma that I'm going through. And then it angered me for sure. And I'll be honest, it shed a couple of tears over it because I was so just at a loss that someone would still try to hurt me, even though I've like moved past, you know, moved past things. So I was kind of finding myself I was like, wow, I'm back here. Someone's trying to continue to hurt me, try to come after me. And then I feel this anger and I, I didn't want to feel anger. I want to feel like I moved past this. <laughs> right. And so I was just like, but then like you talked about, like feeling that, you know, the anger, like, okay, this sucks. This is not right. Anybody tell the story to would, would agree. And so just to be in, have that little bit of space, you know, and, and be angry for a little bit and be with it and then just, right, try to get, start climbing back up again. Absolutely. It's a warranted emotion. So allow it to just be what it is, acknowledge it, focus on the facts about it, and then use it as a stepping stone and use it to fire you into the next chapter. Do you think like as a first responders and just speaking in general, like when we don't deal with our emotions like that, that maybe it's just, we feel like we can't get out of that hole. Like it just, that's just the normal place to be. Is this the bottom of this hole? And, you know, we're, we're a first responder and we're, we're meant to suffer, right? That's just part of the job. We're just suffer here at this low level in this dip of life. Yeah, absolutely. And it even goes for the stuff that I had endured. I literally became immune to it. When people hear pieces of my story, now they're horrified and they're upset and in tears. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's normal. That was normal to me. Yeah. And then now understanding that that wasn't normal and really processing what it really was and, and acknowledging it for what it really was. It, it gives you some relief, but it definitely has brought a, a lot of different emotions as well. And I just, you know, work through them. And that's the biggest piece is it is acknowledging it for what it really is. Because we're like, no, this is good. We're fine. We're just, we're, I'm going to keep it right here. I'm going to control this roller coaster on a straight line. Nice and flat. <laughs> we're good. And then it's just like, bam. <laughs> Yeah, it comes to that somewhat of a screeching stop, like at the end of a roller coaster at some point. Yeah. You know, I wanted to point out, like, this was something that just didn't happen to you. I, I feel like just on duty, right? Like you had an off duty, pretty crazy experience where you were saved somebody mm -hmm. from a house fire. I did. Four people, actually. Um, my family and I were headed out on a ski trip early one morning. I will note that I was running late <laughs> because that, that plays a key piece in the story. And my husband never says, you know, he doesn't blame me for being late anymore. Uh, but we were running behind and we pulled out of the garage and I could see it was dark out, but we could see heavy smoke. And right away, 
I was like, that's a structure fire. But we couldn't see where it was coming from. So we pulled around the corner and the smoke was so thick on the street, we couldn't tell exactly the source. But we kind of had an idea. It was between two houses. So we pulled into the driveway. My husband was honking. And I got on the phone right away with the fire hall and said, we've got a structure fire. Of course, there's no address on the house. <laughs> Trying to figure out exactly where we were. And he ran around behind and, and hollered, yes, it's this one. And the roof and the whole back of the house was fully involved. And the lights were off in the house. It was dark. So we we're banging on the door and banging on the door. And we we're just about to kick the door in. And all of a sudden, a light come on. And there was a very pregnant woman standing at the top of the stairs, uh, wide eyed, because it looked, it was thinking somebody was trying to break into her house. Not a stitch of smoke in the house, not a smoke detector going off, nothing. She came down and unlocked the door. And we went running in and gathered up two little girls that were with her. And I said, Your house is on fire. You have to go. And we gathered them up and I looked up and the entire ceiling was involved. I could see the flames in the pot lights. I could see it up the seams in the walls. Like it had been going for a while. Got her into her vehicle, drove it out uh, the garage, fire truck pulled up, they opened the door and the roof collapsed. So it was literally oh. a matter of minutes before the ceiling collapsed. And yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. My husband ran me home to get my vehicle so that, that I could run down to the fire hall and I jump in an apparatus and go fully into firefighter mode. And then they backed into a driveway and actually watched me work for the very first time. they had never actually seen me do my job. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. They got to watch everybody in action and you get that feeling like somebody's watching you or somebody's beelining for you and I turn and there's a man on a mission coming up the road and he is like headed straight for me and he walked right up to me and he said I understand you just saved my family oh sorry oh no and I said I did and he gave me the biggest hug and we didn't really know them at all before the incident and we know them very well now. This is, sorry. That's okay. It's right. It's one of those times we have these emotions. It was that's a pretty epic thing to do um in your lifetime. Yeah, and she had a be beautiful baby boy, and she put or they put my husband and I's initials in his name. <laughs> So it is something that will live on forever, um, a story that will be told forever, one that has impacted their family and mine. Um, obviously, the ultimate high in my career. Not many people get to say that they did that and then have, right. you know, their initials in a baby's name is a legacy that will live on. And my son got to watch it and be impacted by it and that's a story that he'll get to tell forever as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is an awesome save. I think we have these cool things that happen on and off or off duty. I mean, I've never like that's I've never done that before off duty. I've uh, done CPR off duty and, you know, plenty of car accidents, but you know, uh, I had to, why I shouldn't say I had to, right? I got to do CPR on a gentleman who collapsed in a restaurant. And my daughter was there with me, who has now become an EMT. Um, after kind of like going through some things in, in her life, she's now decided to become an EMT and, you know, take that, that on. But she kind of like got to see me work a little bit, right? None of my kids have really ever seen seen that. That's kind of a powerful thing. And I had not thought of that really until you said that, like, get to see your work, get to see you do what you do. That's awesome. It, it was extremely powerful. And I didn't quite understand to what magnitude until I started watching my son after, because he was continually drawing pictures of the house fire and where the flames were coming out and, you know, the firefighters in their gear. And when the family came over, 
so that we could meet them once everything had kind of settled down. It had been a couple of weeks after the event. I didn't know that he had actually drawn another picture for them. Oh. And so he gave it to them and he was like, this is your house on fire. And at first I was like, oh, no, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't do that. And she was like, no, that's okay. And then I took a second. I was like, man, this is his way of processing what he's seen. Because through his eyes, it was completely different than what I seen through mine and my husband through his. And it's my job. So I'm used to to doing things to that extreme, not rescuing people out of a house, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and off duty, but <laughs> it is part of the job. And to see it through his eyes was pretty incredible. Yeah. We don't uh, give kids enough credit a lot of times on how, how smart they are and their perspective is right. Just the way their brains formed and everything and different through the different ages, the way they actually see things and take them in completely different than an adult quite often. Absolutely. So I would, I would like to say I mean, the fire department must've been very proud of you to do something so amazing off duty within, you know, the community you serve must've been so proud of you. Sure. <laughs> I didn't know how um, to frame that question. I know the yeah. answer. I kind of know the answer to it. Sorry. I didn't know how to like frame no, that that's out. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. Cause it is what it is. Um, it was just another, just another thing. Um, the media release that they put out was, the number of apparatus that responded and the number of firefighters that responded and that the fire was extinguished successfully. There was no mention of anything. A um, few of the, you know, the guys that I work with and stuff, the, obviously the story kind of circulated amongst us and it was a pretty big deal, but there was absolutely nothing. There was no recognition, no acknowledgement, no nothing. And to me, that's just, Silly. I want to say stupid, but yeah, I'll just yeah, say it. I got it's you. Stupid. Yeah. yeah. Because they could use that to make themselves look so good. These are the caliber of firefighters that we have. This is the type of training that we do. This is the skills that they can use off duty to yeah. save people in the community. Like this, this is the caliber of the fire department that you are paying for as a tax paying citizen. This is, this is us. They just couldn't bring themselves to do it. Of course, you so, know, I have, in my head is like, why? Like, just why? Like, yeah. why do you have to take things to an extreme level of uh, hatred towards somebody? I don't know how to put it. Like, just sad on very the sad. side. Very sad. I mean, there's so many ways that I being the first ever and only female could have been used per se to boost the department in so many ways. When I first got hired, you'll see media releases of departments that will, you know, they've hired their first ever female. Yeah. This is who she is. And I was not allowed to speak to the media. Nothing was allowed to be said. They wanted it completely under the radar. It's like, Oh, okay. You know, and then something like this happens at this magnitude not a word was said. So I allowed the family to say their social media release and what had happened to them and all that first. And then I asked their permission to share my story from my perspective of what happened on social media. And most people at that point hadn't even, they had no idea. They were like, what? Yeah. You did what? Your family did what? I mean, you could have yeah. just drove on by. Yeah, right. Not your, um, one of the not on duty, had, not your problem. Had we left when we were supposed to, we would have missed it completely. It would have been a completely different outcome. One of the neighbors had drove by 10 minutes earlier around the corner to get his mail and back home. And there was not a stitch of smoke. He knew he didn't see anything. Had we left at the same time as he was out there, we would have continued on to the mountain. And I don't even want to think about what would have happened. I was in the right place at the right time by whatever made that happen to be, to be there. 
it yeah. was meant to be. I'm sure there's a, probably a few people listening. Oh, that's your job, right? That's just your job. You shouldn't get any recognition for that. Like just you, you did your job and you should be grateful type of thing. Now I'm going to take a different approach and be like, wow, like you said, this is one of your all-star you know, staff, right? Our staff is made up of these incredible people. This organization is amazing. This just happens to be Lynette. She happened to be off duty and did this, you know, this is like you said, like do that because that adds value to people's lives and adds value to the department and just brings, I feel like the department closer together or could bring the department closer together. Just, Take care of your employees at the very bottom line, right? Do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's what one would hope. Like, that's the ultimate hope, but it, it was never the case. Yeah, that's a lot to endure over your career. So you've done a lot of different work, a lot of like self, it sounds like a lot of self-discovery, a lot of different things. So after retirement, what are you doing and what, what what's going on with your life? I am running my own business. So I do trauma coaching. I teach crisis intervention, critical incident stress management. I've been hosting workshops, healing circle workshops, which literally fill my soul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, giving people a safe and space to be heard and seen and work through their stuff. I have taken all of the tools and things that I have learned along the way that I know work and put them into, into play for other people so they can skip the steps that don't work and, and take part in the stuff that does. There's a lack of support and community when it comes to being able to say, I need help. Yeah. And so to have that space already created and be welcome in with no judgment and no opinion and it's, very powerful. Yeah, I got two questions for you. So like, why is it so important for people to be seen? Why is that such an important like emotion? Acceptance, connection. I think that's where when we are going through trauma, we isolate and we feel like we, you know, we're so alone. And so to actually be seen by other people and understand, hey, me too. I can relate to what you've experienced and connection with other people is a crucial piece when it comes to to healing. Yeah. I was up the other night because I couldn't sleep (laughs) and I watched like the most random thing was Avatar, the new Avatar that was out. And And I thought there was a unique couple unique things in there it was like when they went to like from one tribe to another or were talking to certain people they like they did a a gesture and then like i see you i thought wow that's pretty powerful in a lot of ways you know just to just acknowledge that i see you right like so many people just go through life like they feel like they're not being seen but i feel like i see you gives you like okay we have a connection go ahead talk let's talk Absolutely. One of the exercises that I do in the workshop is you stand face to face with somebody and you hold their hands and you look them in the eye and you say, I see you. I support you. Thank you. I love you. Because those are things that a world of emotion. Sorry. (laughs) It does. It does. But we need to hear those things for ourselves and being able to say them out loud. It's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What's trauma coaching uh, look like? I do one-on-one in-person sessions for anybody that's local. If you're not, they can be done over Zoom. And I give you a different perspective. I can guide you through what it is that you're experiencing, giving you understanding of how your traumatic experience is impacting your current life. So many people are living in their trauma experience now. They're focused on future and trying to control it or they're living in the past and trying to function which they're not yeah (laughs) they're barely getting by and they're running on burnout so being able to show them how it's impacting in their current life 
and focusing on the facts and breaking it down and giving them tools, actual tools. It's not just a sit down and talk therapy kind of session. It's let's get some actual tools in place so that you can cope. Let's be proactive and start working on steps so that you can cope through these things because it's never ending. We're going to be dealing with things our whole entire life. So having some healthy coping skills in place is crucial. And I think that was a big piece for me is I had healthy coping mechanisms put in place for my job. That was, that was a non-negotiable for me right from day one, healthy coping so that I could process the calls and deal with the things that I was seeing that was completely abnormal. But I didn't have any coping skills for the personal attacks. I had no idea what to do when it was personal. And so being able to give people these tools, because some of it is personal, and then some of it is out of their control. And so deciphering yeah. the two and having healthy coping mechanisms for both, it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. What's also a big deal is being proactive, right? Instead of reactive, because when you're reactive, I, the outcomes, at least in my personal experiences, not as good as you would hope they would be. For sure. And so many of these departments, like I know mine included, was but this is how we've always done it. So we just wait for it to happen and then we are reactive instead of taking that proactive approach because it's it's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's when. So let's actually have some things in place for that when it does happen on a bigger scale. We've practiced so many times with the small stuff that it just comes naturally with the big stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think that comes with being able to Look at yourself and say, I need to do some work on myself and be willing to put in the effort because it's effort. It's not easy, but I try to tell people it's worth it though. It's just, it's worth it. You know, and you talked about being, once again, about being proactive, like, okay, we can learn from the past. We can do all these things, but man, if you, you learn to be a little bit more proactive in your life, like I said, those ups and downs are just a little bit different and easier to, to get through. Totally. And I think a big fear for people is they don't want to actually deal with the stuff that they've experienced because they don't want to relive it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but you're living it now because you're literally <laughs> stuck in it every day. You're living it. And when you start doing the trauma work and the trauma healing, you're not going back into it. You're just going to sit with it. So you're not going to take a deep dive and relive all of the horrific pieces about it. It's already happened. It's done. We can't, we can't reenact it, but you can actually sit with it and it's not as painful as you, as one would think. And so getting people to have the courage to be able to just go there, I think is the first, the first step. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's that. And it gets, I feel like it gets easier after you start like dealing with this and start removing um, some of the crap in your life, just start filtering it out. And it, you know, these things get easier. They're different. Um, like I said, they're not always going to be easy, but in general, the little things get easier. It does get easier. Absolutely. Where can people find you and see what you're doing and maybe reach out to you, you know, if they need some help. I am Fire Within Crisis Services on pretty much every social media platform. Firewithincrisisservices.com is my website. You can reach me through there. I'm very active on Instagram with stories and um, answering messages and stuff. It's always just me. It's not, I don't have any staff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's just me. And they can find me on Facebook, Instagram, or my website. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on today. Thank you so much for sharing your, your story. I, I know sharing stories like this are not easy, but um, I think it's worth it. Right. I think it's, it's worth, it's worth doing. Your story is, has a lot of power. A quote that impacted me greatly was you don't have a secret, you have a story. Oh, yeah. And I do have a big story to tell. And this was actually kind of the final piece in my own healing journey was I needed to be able to tell my story 
in order to get past the pieces that I had been hanging on to for so long. And that was another determining factor in my retirement was I couldn't tell my story while still employed. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? It takes, it takes precedence. I it's, it's time to put me first. So thank you very much for giving me a space to tell my story and the impact that you're making on others is amazing. So keep doing what you're doing as well. Well, thank you. It's, I love the quote, you know, but it's, it's really, as I tell almost every guest, like I've learned so much from them, like, and just, and it adds value to, to my life. And then I'm like, well, I mean, we're not alone, right? There are people that are similar to me. So I'm like, it's adding value to other people's lives. Like I selfishly get to ask the questions. So I'm very lucky that way, but it's just the, you know, the guests with amazing stories that need to be shared. So you don't feel like you're alone. And I think you can listen to almost any podcast and you'll pick up something that'd be like, okay, yeah, I could do that. Or I didn't realize I was doing that. You know, So there's always something there. But it doesn't come Absolutely. from me. It comes from the guest. <laughs> but it does come from you too. You play a big, you play an important role. So thank you for giving us the space to be able to do that. And you know, it can work for yourself in your own healing journey as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Please reach out to Lynette and she has got you. I can tell, right. I've done a lot of self-work myself and been in that business for a long time. And I can tell, you know, when you, you talk to another person that has done that to you. You're like, Oh, I can tell by the power of your words. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being on today. My pleasure. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you access your podcast. If you know someone that would be great on the show, please get a hold of our host, Jerry Dean Lund through the Instagram handles at Jerry fire and fuel or at Enduring the Badge Podcast. Also, by visiting the show's website, EnduringTheBadgePodcast.com for additional methods of contact and up-to-date information regarding the show. Remember, the views and opinions expressed during the show solely represent those of our hosts and the current episode's guests. <laughs>